Kelly, are you ready? I'm ready. Ladies and gentlemen, right club audience, Amy Keesian with reason in three, two, one, begin. <clears throat> My entire life has been ruled by passion. It sounds good. It's a romantic notion, one that's often idealized by fans of, say, Colette and Anais Nin. Young women love to quote Colette because she seems to already know the things they're hoping to discover about love and sex. His knees were as cool as oranges. We used to whisper that to each other in college as if that was the secret to great sex, as if cool oranges on the back of your knees was some kind of crazy aphrodisiac. <laughs> of course I know what she's talking about. Don't you know what she's talking about? I'm sexy. I'm 50. Anyway, Colette slept with her step stepson and Anais Neen slept with her dad. <laughs> So, you know, passion. But I'm not, I'm not here to speak ill of the dirty ladies of literature. God bless them in their dirty panties. If living a life of passion works out well for you because you stay married to a banker while you're living your boho life of, in Paris with Henry Miller, that's, that's awesome. But I'm here to tell you that a life of passion can also be a cautionary tale and maybe not the most effective life plan. When I graduated from my elite women's institution, I knew two things. I wanted to live a life full of love and performance, specifically improvisational performance, and probably improvisational love, since it's hard to script stuff like that. At the time, ground zero for improv was in Chicago, so my way was clear. I had to go to Chicago, work as a waitress, and attend classes at Second City, like every single one of my comedic idols. But, oh my god, my college boyfriend. My college boyfriend was still in New York, and oh my god, he couldn't live without me, so oh my god, I had to stay with him and do stand up, which I was bad at because my parents stayed married. <laughs> but you know, passion. So I stayed where I was. So I kind of washed out of stand-up, and I went to work in magazines instead, and got married to a really great guy. Not this one. <laughs> he was boring in the relationship with sibling-y, but this was my attempt to impose an artificial sense of reason upon my passionate nature. At the time, I wrote a piece for the online magazine Nerve, boasting about how married sex was so much better than single sex because... Less chlamydia? <laughs> Here's a word of advice to aspiring writers of erotica. Don't boast about how great your sex life is in the, in the pages of Nerve. I actually, I, actually, I actually said in that piece, oh, we didn't have a click. We didn't need a click. You know what the click is? It's the sound of your brain turning off. That worked out well. I walked into an, ed into an editorial meeting at the Brooklyn-based City Magazine where I was slowly, slowly working my way up the masthead and came face to face with passion. Nick was the art director. He rode a motorcycle. His other art directing gig was at Penthouse. He was lowbrow like Stanley Kowalski and knew just how to pull me off my pedestal and get the colored lights going. I left my husband for him and he didn't leave his wife for me. <laughs> But you know, passion. <laughs> As it happened in the middle of my divorce and the panic attacks that accompanied it, I landed the absolute best job for me in the history of jobs, staff writer at Cosmopolitan Magazine. Never mind that my mom would have preferred that it was the New Yorker. Under the early tenure of Kate White, Cosmo was a hilarious, self-referentially iconic version of its 70s incarnation where we winked at smarter readers while feeding the endlessly profitable and starving maw of mass appeal. Example, Matthew McConaughey was in a movie about a submarine, and I was encouraged to put a caption on it that said, Das Booty. <laughs> for those first years, I was in my professional happy place. OK, so I wasn't writing for Saturday Night Live, and I wasn't winning any Pulitzers, unlike some people. 
But I was in New York. I made decent money in a glamorous-ish job. I got to go on press trips. And on weekends, I could do readings, making fun of my job amongst my smarty pants friends. And life was great, except that I still had this married boyfriend, a woman wearing a feathered mask and not much else, told me sternly uh, at a Halloween party that you don't have to stay with the first person you get kinky with. But I did! I had to devote my entire erotic life to him, which I, which bled over into my work life, requiring me to sneak out of the office for midday assignations in the dressing room at Brooks Brothers or in a basement-level alleyway under the Chelsea Hotel because, you know, passion! <laughs> anyway, the new executive editor caught me skulking back in after a three-hour lunch one too many times, and I got fired. Oh, wait. <laughs> Laid off. <laughs> That was okay, I had years of great experience under my belt. I was gonna get hired by another magazine in no time flat, except it was August 2001. <laughs> I already burned through half my severance when 9-11 happened, a day that was of course terrible for everyone, but it was really terrible for me because after a day that I cannot describe to you, I had to go home alone because my boyfriend was with his wife. What follows is an unbearable number of lost years during which my boyfriend's wife left him, which meant I had one, a cocaine-addled, alcoholic narcissist with abusive tendencies that were now free to be unleashed upon me. Passion! That was okay, because I had been washed down this great river of passion and deposited upon the shores of erotic fulfillment and romantic instability, and that's what Colette would do with her cool orange need stepson, right? <laughs> so fast forward a couple years and I'm on a plane to San Francisco with a broken collarbone, 30 extra stress-related pounds, and a down payment size credit card debt, living in my sister's basement and taking improv classes. Now, my life is actually pretty great right now. This fucked up journey did lead me to my great passion, the six foot four Jewish lumberjack known as Randy Hauser, our astounding daughters, three great stepkids who I am not sleeping with. <laughs> My point is, I could have done that 20 years ago and skipped the preeclampsia brought on by my 30 extra pounds. I could have had college savings for all these kids. I, I, could, have, I could have avoided unbelievable amounts of pain. Oh, that's the end of your seven minutes and the... And, oh, you could have, you could have, you could have said that. That would have been a great way to end it. But sorry, Amy. <laughs>